Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to the show. It is Monday, April 1st, 2024. I'm James Gale, your, your host, and welcome to the James Gale, your show. We air every Monday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. where we talk about all the things that I, I don't think people are talking enough about. And the objective is not that you agree with everything that I'm going to say. The objective is that we have good debate, good discussion, good conversation about the issues that matter most in our society. And so I'm right here every Monday, 5 to 6 o'clock on 92.1 FM on the dial. It's the People Station. And again, we're talking about things that matter. If you want to call in, I'm at 919 eight seven two ninety two ten and in the two five two nine three seven seventy four hundred I want to encourage you to follow me on my social media platforms anywhere there's a social media account just type in at J D Gale your J D G A I double L I A R D. I've got a lot to talk about today and I'm going to be checking at the break on some of your comments on social media and then I'll, I'll be able to to parlay them and to kind of talk about some of the things you're talking about but I always start with what we were doing together when we were last together what were you doing since we were last together and so I like to do a segment called um, he said what and he said what is my segment about what your pastor preached about it was a lot of folk in church yesterday because yesterday was Easter Sunday and let me just say this we, we don't we don't need to be shaming folk who you know are Christmas Mother's Day Easter Saints right um, look I'm just glad people are in the house and so if you came for Easter and you're not normally in a church thank you for coming to a church certainly appreciate everybody was at Word Tabernacle Church I preached about God is still at work God is still at work. The fact that he rose from the dead is an indication that there's still work he's doing in redeeming people. There's still work he's doing in reconciling people. There's still work he's doing in rearranging things in people's lives and removing things from people's lives. And so I, I just encourage people regarding that. It was a great day of worship. We saw huge crowds. And I want to, so what did your pastor preach about? You know, I know if you're, you're from Word, you don't need to, to chime in on this, but if you attend some other church, and again, our audience is Raleigh, Durham, Roanoke Rapids, Wilson, Rocky Mount, Scotland Neck, Tarboro, uh, what did your pastor preach about? Let me tell you one of the things that is encouraging me, and I like to kill demons. You know, that's something we like to do on our show because they get, they can get all out of control. When I When I watch the various reports of so many churches, I'm talking about churches that may have you know, 75, even 50 members, 100 members, or churches that may be much larger. One of the things that I've noticed, particularly looking at posts from this past weekend, is that in many situations, the church is alive and well. There is this fallacy. There is this uh, perspective that churches are dying and people aren't going to church. And, and I, I just don't think that, as a matter of fact, I know that's not true. I think Oftentimes, the people that are perpetuating those myths, you got to watch the myths that people perpetuate. I think the myths that people perpetuate, they do so as a way of justifying their own decisions. And so if they're not going to church, they're going to have the perspective, well, people don't really go to church anymore. And that's just simply not true. The church is alive and well. The church is a necessary institution for the betterment of our society and I'll give you an advice as we're starting off today's show. Get you a good church. This past week was Holy Week, and so it was a big deal. In many of our congregations, midweek services and uh, Maundy th uh, Thursday services and the communion services and platform services and Good Friday services, I want to shout out the Eastern North Carolina Ministerial Alliance. We had the opportunity to host them for the second year for the citywide Good Friday service here in Rocky Mount. We had seven community pastors proclaiming each one of the seven last statements or seven last words of Jesus. And 
combined a community choir and we all gathered together. We ate together. Uh, we watched a little bit of the Passion of Christ together, and then we worshiped together. We gave together so that we can use those proceeds to be a blessing to other individuals and organizations. And I just think it was a strong statement about the unity of the church. And so shout out to the Eastern North Carolina Ministerial Alliance. That's kind of what I've been up to since we were together last. I want to lay out a few things for you. There's so many things I want to talk about, and I'm trying to decide where I want to begin um, and so I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin, I'm going to begin right where I have my notes. And so I want to, this is April, this is April 1st, something's going to happen in April, family. What's going to happen in April, as a matter of fact, it's going to happen April 24th, and that is going to be the convening of the short session of the North Carolina General Assembly and, you know, they have two sessions every calendared year or every two biennium, every two years. The first is the long session. The long session takes, let me just educate us for a moment because I want us to understand how things happen, how laws are passed, how things happen in our society. And so we have two sessions every biennium. A biennium is a two-year session. Your state representative and your state senator is elected for a two-year cycle. He or she is elected for a two-year cycle, and when they first get elected and they get sworn in, they go into what's called the long session. The long sessions are always in odd number years, and so 2023 ended the long session. Now we're in 2024, and even number years, which are also your election years, are your short session. Part of the reason is a short session because everybody wants to get out so they can campaign, but the other reason is a short session is because the biggest part of the budget bill which is the biggest bill enacted every biennium has already been passed. And so I want to encourage you uh, to be paying attention. I'm going to be bringing issues that are coming before us in the North Carolina General Assembly. I suspect, and I'll I'll save it for a future show, I expect um, there are certain things that I know are going to come forward that I think we need to talk about. And so the short session is going to convene on April 24th. I want to encourage you. I'm guessing that short session is probably going to run through I would say they're probably going to be officially done by 4th of July. Um, I'll, I'll keep you posted on all of that. There are certain bills that cannot be that cannot be brought forth during this uh, short session. So it's not just any old thing, but there are some matters that can be brought forth. I want to educate us a little bit about the short session and the things that can come forth. Any bills that directly are, and primarily affect the state budget. Now, that's 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 them being slick, right? Because I mean, technically. There's a whole lot of ways that you can pass some other type of legislation, attach an appropriation to it, which means attach a budget item, a line item to it from a budget perspective, which means then is then eligible to for the short session. But technically, um, it is written that bills directly and primarily affecting the state budget, um, including the budget of an occupational license, um, bills authorizing a fee for a unit of state government, those things can be brought forth. Any proposed Proposing an amendment or an amendment to the North Carolina Constitution can be brought forth in the short session. Proposing an amendment or amendments to the North Carolina Constitution, uh, solely making statutory and transitional changes to implement bills, they can come forth. And so, as you can see, there are just different things that can come forth in the short session. What I'm just simply trying to make you aware of is that we have legislators going back to work on our behalf, and we need to be mindful of the things they're talking about. As a matter of fact, let's stop for a quick little quiz. How about this? Y'all ready? Here's the quiz. The quiz is, who represents you in the North Carolina General Assembly? Who is your state representative? Here's the quiz. Who represents you in the North Carolina Senate? You should know that. We all have someone representing us in the state as a state rep. We all have people representing us at, in the Senate. Um, let me see. Who represents you on the school board? Who represents you on city council? What ward are you in? What district are you in? These are things that we all should be familiar with. Most of us, when we get a little bit further on the federal side, we can be sometimes a little bit more aware. Like we know who represents us in Congress. But who represents you in the state house? And do you have access to him or her? And if you're not hearing from him or her, um, if you, they've not made themselves available in your community, if they've not made yourself, themselves available in 
discussing the things or legislating on the things that matter to you, then it's, you need to hold them accountable for that. And so ha- if, the, if you're inviting them and they're not coming, if you're not getting a newsletter from them, if you're not hearing from them in any regard, um, that should concern you. And so I just want to lift up that April 24th begins a short session. Hey, this is James Galliard, and this is the James Galliard Show. I'm with you every Monday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. right here on Choice FM. You can follow me on all the social media platforms. So let, while we're on voting, while we're on politics, I was reading an article called The Party of None, N-O-N-E, The Party of None, and it talks about how there is now an increase in voter registration amongst unaffiliated individuals. So listen to this. The number of North Carolina voters registered as unaffiliated continues to climb That number is now 2.7 million. The number of voters registered as an unaffiliated continues to climb now at 2.7 million. More people than ever are listing their party choice as, listen to this, no thanks in North Carolina. Meaning I don't want to be a Democrat and I don't want to be a Republican um, with increasing numbers. Uh, How do you feel about that? Um, I, you know, I'll let you know a little nugget about me. You may or may, may not have known this, but prior to my running um, in the North Carolina General Assembly as a Democrat, I was unaffiliated for many, many years. And part of the reason that um, I had to pick a side is because I wanted to run um, and I wanted to get on ballot. And it's very, very difficult to run in a countywide election and um, a, particularly a partisan election. It's one thing if you can run nonpartisan, but if you're running a partisan election, it's very difficult to get on ballot in North Carolina, uh, in, 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 get on ballot as, as an unaffiliated individual. And so listen to this. Unaffiliated voters first eclipsed Democrats as the state's largest affiliation in 2022. Since 2020, the unaffiliated quote-unquote party, because it's really not a party, the unaffiliated party has added more than 453,000 voters which is a 20% gain. These voters tend to skew younger, and most are born outside of the state. So we have a lot of people migrating into North Carolina who are now um, unaffiliated. I'm going to say something about this now, so just hang tight for what I'm talking about. Republicans have added about 164,000 registered voters over the last four years. Democrats have lost 114,000. Third-party groups have also gained more traction, with Libertarians picking up more than 10,000 and the new No Labels Party adding nearly 8,000. The shifts mirror national ideological trends rejecting polarization. Um, I think that's really what's key here. I think people hate the the extremism. I know hate is such a strong word. As you know, I, I, I tend to pick more on Republicans than Democrats on my show only because they're so much easier to pick on, Um, but not because I'm not an equal opportunist and I'm still going to call it wherever I need to call it, regardless of who the affiliate is. But, you know, I I will say that whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, polarization and extremism is just, it's so divisive. It is so difficult. And I think what happens is in our primaries, we we tend to vote for the more, extreme candidate, right? So what happens on general election, not always, but oftentimes on general election, you're looking at a Democratic candidate and or a Republican candidate, and as people go to the polls, they're not thrilled about their options. Um, and I'm going to talk about this relative to our ag commissioner. A, that, that's, that's short for agriculture commissioner. So we might as well get into all these details. So we're learning about short session today, and this is the James Galliard Show, and that's what we're doing. We're, we, we recognize that in order to move our community forward, we have to educate ourselves. We have to be familiar with the process. We have to be familiar with how things get done. So we're learning that in 2024, we're about to enter into the short session. We're being challenged on understanding who represents us and the General Assembly, both in the State Senate and the State House, and also who represents us on and county commissioners and on city council, so that we're and for our school board. And, and now we're learning about this whole issue of unaffiliated voters. Now, what's interesting for me, and I want to get your opinion on this, and I'll check your comments in just a moment. Please share this on your platforms. We're going to try to shift off in the weeks ahead from Facebook to YouTube, but we're not doing that just yet. But we're going to work on that over this month. 
So then hopefully by May we'll kind of shift largely to a YouTube platform. But whatever platform you're watching right now, I want you to go ahead and share this. Um, but I, I think where I struggle with is that you have this large group of unaffiliated voters. Now, pay attention to what I'm about to say. Try to track with me. But when you have centrist candidates, and by centrist candidate, I mean like someone that's moderate, that they're not trending far left or far right, by and large, we reject those kind of candidates. So it's interesting to me because I think we could come up with much better elected officials as a matter of fact, can I say this for a minute? If you know elected officials that you really dislike and you voted, then blame the people who didn't vote. Because the people who didn't vote are the reason we have such poor candidates in office. And so, by all means, cast your blame where it belongs. And, I mean, I literally, I want to engage people better. Can y'all help me with this? Why do you think people don't engage in the political process? Why do you think we are not in large clips voting? Why do you think so many of us stay behind and just don't participate in the process? What, do you, what are some of your thoughts about that? I mean, think, think about it. Every part of our life is impacted by voting and by public policy. That's a theme on our show. And, and even though we see this rise of people that are registering as unaffiliated, yet when there are centrist, moderate candidates, by and large, there is no appetite for them. And so people that can be that, that moderate candidate that can bring both sides together in the middle, we tend to not vote for them. Um, and so I would argue that, and this is where I'm going with this, because I know we're tempted to give all this credit to these people who register unaffiliated. But I would argue that, that people that are truly unaffiliated voters are really, they're, they're really not driving the political landscape, if they were driving the political landscape, they will be responding to more centrist candidates. And we don't see that happening. And so I think we're still catering. I want to hear you to hear me. We're catering to ideological wings of both parties. And I think, and, and this is why we see in Congress, like they just are having a hard time getting good policy done because you have these extremists on both sides. And let me be really clear. They exist on both sides, and yet, by and large, they do not represent the overwhelming majority of us that are voting. And so I just thought that was interesting. I don't know what your perspective is, but why is it that you think people are registering and in increasing numbers in unaffiliated capacity? So uh, as unaffiliated voters, when, when you look at the breakdown of voters overall in North Carolina— what you discover is that the highest percentage are unaffiliated, followed by Democrats, and then followed by Republicans who are gaining ground on Democrats, which is always interesting to me that, so if that's the case, listen to what I just said. The highest percentage of voters are unaffiliated, followed by Democrats, and then followed by Republicans. And yet, by and large, particularly in the state offices, Republicans win so many more seats. And why is that if they represent such a significant, significantly smaller portion of the electorate? For a couple of reasons. One is gerrymandering because they just literally draw districts that cheat, right? So they draw populations of people in one area so that they, they stack them and pack them in certain districts. So they wind up getting maybe the low 50%, 51, 52, 53% of all the votes, but they wind up with 65% or 60% or 62% of all the seats. Um, that's one reason. I think the other reason is because sometimes I think people that are unaffiliated really aren't. They claim to be for whatever kind of political or social expediency might be attached, or sometimes just in terms of fear, because it is a matter of public record. Like if you just type in NC voter lookup, if you Google NC voter lookup right now and just type in somebody's name. And if you know their county, you know, if there's a difficult name like James Galliard, I mean, there's no other James Galliard in North Carolina. So if you type in James Galliard and you don't even have to know that I live in Nash County, you could just hit James Galliard and search and I'm going to pop up and then you can click on my name 
And you'll see that, you know, I'm a registered Democrat. You can see my ethnicity. You can see that I'm African-American. So all of this is a matter of public record. So I thought it was real interesting as I looked at that data in terms of what's going on with that. Let me shift gears a little bit, and I want to introduce you to something else. I'm just educating today. So I hope today's show is not going to be boring for you because I'm educating you. First of all, I'm educating us about short session and then about the party of none and just a little bit about what goes on in short session. Um, but let me let me introduce you to something else. And I'll introduce this, and then we'll go for our first commercial break. It's Project Kitty Hawk. Project Kitty Hawk. Are you familiar with that? Have you heard that? Um, Project Kitty Hawk is named after that town in the Outer Banks. This is where the Wrights brothers had their historic airplane first flight, right? Although Project Kitty Hawk has nothing to do with aviation. What Project Kitty Hawk is, I want you to know what's going on in our state, y'all. That's why I'm sharing this. I want us to be knowledgeable. I want us to know more than the lyrics to songs. And that has its point and its place, but we need to know more. So Project Kitty Hawk is, and I'm going to be very critical of it. I'm just let y'all know ahead of time. Project uh, Kitty Hawk is the brainchild of the University of North Carolina uh, system. The UNC system leaders wanted to create a new education technology, a nonprofit education technology that was designed to help the UNC campuses run online degree programs for states working adults. So this is in direct competition with um, Southern New Hampshire University, University of Phoenix, Strayer, Grand Canyon, Liberty, Western Governors University, um, University of Phoenix, and so Project Kitty Hawk is in direct competition, if you will. Let me just be very clear. There are some good players in the online academic arena, and there are some bad players. Many of these schools are arranged as for-profit institutions, and it is just a money-making machine. The degrees are much more expensive. In some situations, they're not considered as credible. I'm not saying that's always the case. But certainly in some situations, it's it's almost viewed as just a money-making machine. And people, they spend a lot of money on marketing. As a matter of fact, if you Southern New Hampshire University, nine times out of ten, you've seen those commercials. You've seen Strayer commercials. You've seen University of Phoenix commercials, Grand Canyon University commercials, Liberty. And so the state system was basically like, you know what? We have all of these North Carolinians that are working adults that are going back to school in, at one of these online university systems. And if we could create our own system within North Carolina that would in essence be, uh, uh, how can I say this, um, an extension of the UNC campus system. So think of it like all the UNC system schools that we have, right? UNC and UNC Wilmington and UNC Pembroke and UNC Charlotte and NC State. And, and I'm going to talk about NC State, you know that, in a minute. Um, and all the schools we have, Fayetteville State, Elizabeth City State, of which I'm a trustee. Shout out to all of my Elizabeth City State folk. And uh, matter of fact, shout out your your, your, North, your North Carolina school, um, ECU. And so if you attended or an alumni or have a child at a North Carolina-based college, go ahead and shout that school out. And so the UNC system leadership says, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to create in essence, an an additional campus, but it's going to be an online campus. And all of our UNC schools that want to plug into this Project Kitty Hawk campus can then embellish and have better and more successful online platforms so that we can educate more children, more young adults. It's not children, more young adults. This initiative is called Project Kitty Hawk. And a whole lot of money was allocated to Project Kitty Hawk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when we get on the other side of the break. This is James Galliard. You're listening to the James Galliard Show right here on Choice 92.1 FM. If you want to take my, I'll be happy to take your calls in the 252 at 937-7400 and the 919 at 872-9210. Or go ahead and message me on Facebook. And while we're on this commercial break, I'm going to take a look. I'll be right back. Thanks for listening. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. 
Pops Diner, 132 South Church Street, Rocky Mount. Juicy burger, hot, delicious wing, yummy spaghetti, and the first pizza to ever be served downtown Rocky Mount. Hot, delicious pizza and more at Pops Diner. Pops Diner for hot dogs. Pops Diner for lunch. Open daily from 11 till 7 p.m. City workers get the Pops hookup. Pops Diner. Open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wings, pizza, burgers, spaghetti, salads, and more. Hot, fresh, and fast at Pops downtown Rocky Mount. Open 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. North Carolina requires ID to vote in 2020. If you need ID, get a no-fee ID card at your local NCDMV to vote by mail. Include a copy of your ID inside the envelope. For more info, go to safevotenc.org or ncblackalliance.com. Calling all women, calling all current and future moms, childbirth professionals, child care and medical professionals. UNC Health presents an event you don't want to miss. Be a part of the advanced screening and panel discussion for the short film, Toxic, a deep dive into a black woman's pregnancy. Join us Thursday, April 11th from 6 until 8 p.m. at John Chavis Community Center, Raleigh for an opportunity to discuss black women's maternal outcomes, care and methods of self-care and advocacy. Dinner's free and so is admission. Thursday, April 11th at the John Chavis Community Center, 505 Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, Raleigh. Email equityinclusion at unchealth.unc.edu for more information. Toxic, presented by UNC Health and the North Carolina Health Equity Collaborative. An event you don't want to miss. April 11th through 17th is Black Maternal Health Week across the country. You are in news. Want to live the comfortable American life? Well, a new study from Smart Assets reveals just how much income you'll need in certain major U.S. cities to achieve that goal. Now, the analysis used the popular 50-30-20 budgeting rule as a benchmark. This approach allocates 50% of income for necessities like housing, transportation, and groceries, while 30% goes toward discretionary spending and entertainment, and 20% is for paying off debt or investing. Now, according to Smart Assets findings, the average salary needed for a single person to live comfortably here in the U.S. is $96,500 per year. However, the required income varies significantly across different metropolitan areas. For example, in New York City, known for its high cost of living, a single person needs to earn more than $138,000 to maintain a comfortable lifestyle. For AURA News, I'm Jamie Jackson. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. My people, my people, we are back. Thank you for listening. I'm James Galliard, and this is the James Galliard Show. This is where we get together every Monday from 5 to 6 p.m. right here on Choice FM. They've reached out to me about adding a Tuesday. We're praying about that, thinking about that, talking about that, trying to strategize on how we best do that. I do want to spend more time than an hour a week with you. And so if you're enjoying the show, if it's helpful, if it's informative, and I'm talking about things that are really challenging your thinking and expanding your exposure. I love to hear about that. I love to know about that. I'm going to jump in on some of your comments in just a moment, but I want to finish up just a little bit of educating us about Project Kitty Hawk. And so, again, this has come out of the UNC system leadership. I I remember, you know, being a part of this process early on when I was in North Carolina General Assembly and having a discussion with Peter Hines, who is the president of the UNC system and personally have felt like this has taken us way too long, something we should have tapped into a very, very long time ago. And we need to be able to do online attendance and online education better than we're doing it. The uh, Randy Ramsey, chairman of the uh, UNC system's board of governors, um, the North Carolina commented on how this is literally a big deal, how big a deal this is. I want you to hear me, okay? The North Carolina General Assembly appropriated $97 million in pandemic recovery funds for this nonprofit venture, $97 million. This was an outgrowth of the pandemic, right? Because I mean, I went through this with, with with my children, but, you know, Jada, she was a student at Chapel Hill and, you know, she was like every other student, you know, couldn't go on campus. And and so as pandemic recovery funds became available, I'm not going to get into all the dynamics of this, but I will say this to us. 
so much good that has come out of the pandemic in terms of the re- recovery funds. In many situations, those bills that came out of the federal government were unanimously voted down. The Republican Party voted against. And yet those funds, and it got passed because of Democratic leadership, and then those funds hit the states, and the very people that um, are of the party that oppose them now take all of the credit for the formation of programs that came about as a result of those funds being made available. So be careful, people. Let's pay attention to voting records. That's also a matter of public record. And so what the, the, the objective of Project Kitty Hawk, and if you're just joining us, I'm James Gallier, and this is the James Gallier Show. We're just, I'm just educating people this Easter Monday. I didn't want to get into stuff real heavy. I wanted to educate us about the short session. I wanted to educate us um, a little bit about what happens in the short session. And now we're talking about this, this Project Kitty Hawk that is kind of new for many of us. We talked about Party of None and the rise in affiliate vote, unaffiliated voters. The objective of Project Kitty Hawk would draw students um, at a critical time where uh, university systems are really struggling with enrollment, particularly our private universities. I mean, we're seeing this with St. Augustine. I probably need to do a show about St. Aug and the fiscal woes that they're in and the challenges they're really having. I think they're really going to have a really difficult road back. I don't see a road back for St. Aug right now. We're certainly working behind the scenes and lots of other people are as well, but I, I think this is going to be a really, really long um, recovery and road back for St. Aug. I, I would love to see them merge with another institution until they got strong and back on their feet. I think we need to do a better job of helping each other, and sometimes we need to give up power and authority, and we need to merge and work with other people until we get our own strengths and until we are able to patch up our own weaknesses what I would, I didn't plan on going here. This is almost like a Sunday sermon, right, where I'm, I prepare one thing, but then I feel led to talk about something else. I think we have to be really careful that we are. So we could easily wind up in a situation. Let me say this about St. Augustine University. And if you're, you know, trustee or president, if you're listening, I invite you to call in 919-872-9210. I think if we're not careful, and I see this in so many situations where we'd rather have 100% of nothing than 50% of something. And I would rather see St. Aug merge with like a Shaw University or to merge with another university system while they get strengthened than to, for them to try to do it on their own, which I just don't see the pathway forward, for them to try to do it on their own because there's some systemic, structural, institutional problems there. And you don't fix those overnight. It's the reason why people died of COVID. Part of the reason people died of COVID is because they were secretly sick anyway. I just said something that is powerful. See, sometimes organizations and people and institutions are secretly sick. And what what do you, what I mean by secretly sick? What I mean is on the surface, they look okay. On the surface, they look strong. They look like they have answers. They look like their systems are in place. But deep down inside, secretly, underneath the surface, they are struggling. And when some tragedy hits or some unexpected situation arises, then that secret struggle that existed beneath the surface winds up becoming exacerbated. And when it gets exacerbated, it winds up fast-tracking their demise. That's why people, particularly African Americans, died in a disproportionate way during COVID because we had issues like hypertension and we were struggling with food insecurities. We were struggling with environmental challenges. Um, There was higher incidences of obesity and of various uh, of other health conditions that were, there was a health disparity. So when that disease hit us, our body responded in a more severe way. I, I think that's to a certain extent what's going on with St. Aug. And let me just be super clear. I want to see St. Aug make it. I, I support and advocate for St. Augustine University, as I do every HBCU, particularly HBCUs. I'm, look, I'm an advocate of all schools. Let me educate you on the three types of schools. PWIs, those are primi- primarily white institutions. 
um, MSIs, minority serving institutions, and HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. So UNCG would be an example of an MSI. That's a minority serving institution. Chawan University would be an MSI. They're a minority serving institution. That means they they are not historically an HBCU. They're not historically black college or university, but they serve a large percentage of students of color. Okay. So I digress. <laughs> Come on back in here. Um, and so the objective, we're still talking about Project Kitty Hawk, believe it or not. The objective um, is to increase enrollment because you have a flattening of adult enrollment. Actually, you have a flattening of 18 to 24-year-old population. That 18 to 24-year-old is beginning to flatten in terms of four-year colleges. You start to see, I mean, we are seeing this with so many schools, especially our private universities in North Carolina. And so, I mean, UNC Greensboro's enrollment has dropped by 12% since 2019, since COVID. UNC Asheville's dropped by 19%. And so... This is the problem. We appropriated those funds over two years ago, and Project Kitty Hawk is just not moving forward like it should. All of their projections are lower than they expected. I think it's a great idea. I think it's the right idea, but I think we have the wrong people running the idea. And be clear, I'm a fan of Peter Hines. He's a personal friend. I could text him right now, call him right now. Um, I like Peter Hines. He's the president of the UNC system. I just don't think he's the right guy. I don't think he has the expertise to be able to run this type of robust program. If it were me and I, you know, I was calling the shots on this one, I would have peeled off someone from a Liberty University or a Western Governors University or University of Phoenix, someone who knows how the sausage is made. And I would have offered them a lot of money to come to North Carolina and help put our system together. I think we need industry experts. And um, so that's Project Kitty Hawk. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to educate you about one more thing, and then I'm going to talk sports before we end up. Let me look at what y'all are talking about here because um, I've got some regular listeners, and I appreciate all of you for jumping on in. I asked a question about why people don't vote, why you don't think they're engaged. LaShawn Jenkins says, I truly don't think systemically or sy systemically we understand the idea of political inter interdependence. It's a great point. Um, and let me just chime in on that, LaShawn. I think oftentimes we think that that we can easily want to embrace one side or the other when the reality of it is I think the best public policy is in the middle. And I think we need to recognize that there there is good and bad in both. And we need to make sure that we have a clear agenda. What I would say, LaShawn, is that I don't know that we have a clear agenda. Like, we don't have, okay, here I go. Um, I think the agenda for the African-American community and the agenda for people of color, I think it has been diluted by the LGBTQ+. Plus. I always have to say it quick so I get all the letters in. LGBTQ+, plus agenda. Um, because what I can tell you is that oftentimes the policy positions that may advocate for certain populations of people, those policy positions are not great for people of color. And I'm not suggesting they are not LGBTQ plus people of color. What I'm suggesting is that that group of lobbyists, that group of um, uh, that voter base, let me call it, that, let me say it that way, that voter base oftentimes cares about their particular agenda and they don't care about the larger issues, particularly of people of color. And if they've got to choose between a policy position that's going to be good for black people or a policy position that's going to be good for the LGBTQ plus community, oftentimes they're going to choose what's best for them. And I can tell you because I've been in rooms with um, very devout, committed Democrats that um, were advocates for the LGBTQ plus community, and they had no sense of loyalty or passion. I can't begin to tell you— um, when we were fighting for funding for HBCUs, and we had to fight, the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus, those of us who were African-American elected officials, we were fighting because, you know, you have your land-grant institutions like A&T, 
um, is a land grant institution. I'll, I'll have to educate you about what that means at another show, just like NC State is. But when you look at the funding that goes to NC State compared to the funding that goes to a and it is embarrassingly dissimilar, right? So there is disproportionately um, lacking equity. And so we began chasing that down in the General Assembly. And I can tell you, our white counterparts that were huge advocates for the LGBTQ plus community were silent crickets. You know, I'm going to get I'm going to get um, I'm going to get some sound effects in here. So, like, if I had my sound cr- sound effect machine right there, I just would have hit my cricket button. Um, you literally heard crickets from them. They would not stand up and 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 advocate for positions that really matter to us. You, listen, this. I'm an equal opportunist. I told you this. That's my issue with homeschooling. My issue with, um, I'm sorry, my issue with charter, um, with um, opportunity scholarships. My single biggest issue with opportunity scholarships, well, I shouldn't say that because I have a bunch of issues. But one of my issues with opportunity scholarships, I remember having a conversation with parents for um, uh, parents uh, united for school choice. So I forget the exact organization's name. They came into my office lobbying for more money for opportunity scholarships. And I said to them, and I'm going to talk about Leandro maybe a little bit today if I get a minute. I said to them, well, look, we are we are significantly underfunding public education. Here's the deal. I will not fight the increase in opportunity scholarships if you're willing to advocate with me to get Leandro funding into the rest of the public schools. I want you to hear what I just said. I said to the school choice proponents, uh, advocates, who are trying to get increased funding for opportunity scholarships, listen, I will support your opportunity scholarships. All I want you to do is lock arms with me and help me advocate for the other public schools so that every child can have access to a sound basic education. They said no. So that begins to be my issue. My issue begins to be when groups of people only want to see their people, their kind, their issue get across the finish line. That is not how we create prosperity for everyone. The way we create opportunity and prosperity for everyone, we want everyone. Our church vision is everyone thriving. And so I'm, I'm not hating on that student um, that goes to a private school that is now getting state funding to go to that private school. I have my reasons around not liking it, but I would I could stomach it if the other children who were going to those neighborhood schools were attending schools that were properly funded. And, you know, just as a FYI, I'll just throw this in for free. Have you ever called 911? Have you ever had a family member call 911? Have you ever um, before my mother passed away? We had a couple episodes. We, you know. I'm I'm pretty healthy, and so I've never had to be called on for myself. But we've had a few situations where my mother, where she fell, and we had to call 911. And the reason 911 dispatchers, ambulances, uh, vehicles, individuals, those wonderfully trained EMTs and paramedics, part of the reason they could show up the way they did is because of our taxpayer dollars, because we fund a system for emergency response. I don't know of a situation where you can say to the federal, to the state government or to the county, I don't know of a situation where you can say, I don't want my tax dollars going to support the local fire department. Instead, I want to fund my own fire department over here, and I want to take my my funds that are going to the, the fire department that supports everybody, I want to take that money and I want to give it to a different fire department that's a private fire department, and I don't want to support the system that exists for everyone. I don't know a scenario where that happens, because guess what, y'all? It does not happen. And so um, back to Project Kitty Hawk. This is why you have to watch the James Gallia show or listen to the James Gallia show, because I'm going to drop perspective. And I could really, I don't, to be honest, I don't really care if you, like, if you, if you agree with me. I hope you won't dislike me. I don't, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me that you disagree with me because if you're disagreeing with me, it means you are thinking and talking about stuff that matters. 
you're thinking and talking about stuff that can move people's lives forward. So I got all that because I was looking at LaShawn's comment. And so you're right about the idea of political interdependence. I don't think we understand how it all connects, but starts with voter participation. Um, I think people still don't think individually their vote matters, despite the reality that individual votes translate into popular vote. Yes and yes, but I would say this, LaShawn. I don't think it I don't think it starts with voter participation. I think it starts with voter education. Because I think part of the reason people don't participate is because they don't understand. They don't know. We have to better educate them about what that looks like. And so thanks, Ruth Parker, for chiming in. Mike Jones shouting out Winston Salem State, Stephanie Battle shouting out um, North Carolina A and T, y'all and y'all Aggie Pride, LaShawn, ECU two schools, including the Wolfpack, Cindy Dunn. LaShawn Jenkins, I love, let me just say this, I love NC State's track record. I know so many black educators that went, had some interaction, some involvement, some education at NC State. I I do think we need schools of education embedded in our HBCUs. I think we have to get back to our root system, and our root system was, I mean, I, that we oftentimes black colleges, black universities were training grounds for black pastors and for black teachers. And I think to have an Elizabeth city state or a Fayetteville state, and I would have to maybe somebody on this broadcast knows because there are all kinds of interesting people that listen in. I used to know this, but it's kind of fallen off the radar for me, but most of our HBCUs do not have a school of education. I think that is a problem, and I think if we're going to address the diversity in public education, we're going to have to re-embed schools of education within our HBCUs in North Carolina. And so um, Cynthia is shouting out Wesleyan, one of our private uh, schools here in the state, the Toya, North Carolina Central. She's about to be a double um, grad over there. Davida Harrell, um, North Carolina a and Pembroke. And so, so many of you are shouting out. Thank you very much. You're right. You've got Elon. You've got Wesleyan. Um, and so, Stephanie comments on the 100% of nothing versus 50% of something. I really think this is my granddaughter is a student at St. Aug, uh, Valerie Mercer. I, and I, you know, let me, I, I'll do a show on, um, I'll, I'm going to do a show on St. Aug. I'll do a show on St. Aug. Let me. Give me um, a little bit of time to kind of think through that and and how to do that. I've been staying very close to this issue. As you know, our church, uh, we we fund um, HBCUs. We write significant checks, and we're going to do at least one a year. And we started out with Bennett a number of years ago, um, and then Elizabeth City State this past year. There will be another school this coming year, the third weekend of, of September, when we have our HBCU Divine Nine Sunday. And so... Um, so yeah, that's that that's where we are. So let me just wrap up. I'm I'm trying to read your statements and also um and also stay on track. So by now, more than two years into the work of Project Kitty Hawk, that's what I'm educating us about, um, it has hit difficulties. It has dropped its original business model. That's what happens when you assign people a lot of money. So just because you get money to do something, if you don't know how to do it. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. And so it's dropped its original business model and slashed its enrollment projections. So it realized we cannot meet our enrollment projections. And it faces a deadline that complicates its task. What's the deadline? It has to spend its one-time $97 million appropriation by the end of 2026. So that is Project Kitty Hawk. For those of you that did not know what it is, I am right up on my last commercial break. I'm going to go ahead and take the commercial break, and then we'll be right back. This is James Gallier. Listen to the James Gallier Show. I'll be right back right here on Choice 92.1 FM. The James Gallier Show on Choice FM. Pops Diner, 132 South Church Street, Rocky Mount. Juicy burger, hot, delicious wings, yummy spaghetti, and the 
first pizza to ever be served downtown Rocky Mountain. Hot, delicious pizza and more at Pops Diner. Pops Diner for hot dogs. Pops Diner for lunch. Open daily from 11 till 7 p.m. City workers get the Pops hookup. Pops Diner. Open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wings, pizza, burgers, spaghetti, salads, and more. Hot, fresh, and fast at Pops downtown Rocky Mountain. Open 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Hey, Raleigh, your wardrobe deserves the royal treatment, and we've got just the place for you. Martinizing Cleaners, your new go-to dry cleaners in town. We know life gets busy, and that's why Martinizing Cleaners on Raven Ridge Road is here to make your life easier. Experience the convenience of pickup and delivery, same-day service, and trust us with our expert wash and fold service. Our non-toxic approach ensures your clothes and the environment stay fresh. And here's an exclusive offer just for you. Mention Choice FM 92.1 when you visit Martinizing Cleaner and enjoy 50% off on comforters. Yep, you heard it right. 50% off just for being our valued customer. Martinizing Cleaner, 10911 Raven Ridge Road, Unit 101 Raleigh. Call 919-703-0007. Visit martinizing.com slash Raleigh for more details. Martinizing Cleaner, because your clothes deserve the royal treatment. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. My people, I love y'all. This is James Gillier. Listen to the James Gillier Show. We've got our last segment before we call it quits for today. So many of you have been chiming in. I want to make sure I'm clear. Yes, um, thank you for the reminder of North Carolina Central. I am aware that they have a school of education. My point that I was making, and it's a great one. My daughter LaToya is a student there. She's about to get her second degree from there. Uh, the point that I was making is that when you look at the law, we have more four-year. Now, listen, y'all, don't don't bite me, okay? For this statement I'm going to make because a lot of times people, so I'm being very specific about what I'm saying. North Carolina has more four-year HBCUs than any other state in the country. I said four-year because you do have other states with more HBCUs, but they're not all four-year HBCUs. What I, My point that I was making is that given the large number of four-year HBCUs that we have, we need, I think half of them at least need schools of education. I think we have a teacher crisis. Um, I served on the governor's task force around diversity in public education, and we've been talking in great detail. Now, gra- now granted, some of what needs to happen to to fill the field with African American and ed- educators of color is that we got to pay them more. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I mean, I, people need to be able to. It, it's it bothers me when I can hire a staff person out of public education at my church and pay them more than what they make in the school system. Um, that, I mean, I'm glad to have the talent, but it bothers me that that's the reality of things. Um, LaShawn made a comment about us fighting with Leandro since 1997. Let me, let me, let me just whet your appetite with that. And I'm going to dedicate a whole show to Leandro. Um, that's a court case that start. It the court case was filed in 1994, but it was 1997 that the state Supreme Court ruled in favor of Leandro. And so, and what they basically, not basically, what they ruled in 1997 was that every student had a constitutional right to a sound, basic education. What is interesting for me about that court case is that that court case initiated in the East, largely within the East, Cumberland County, Halifax County, Hoke County, Robeson County, and Vance County. Um, And then in 2004, so that was 1997, the state Supreme Court ruled that the children had access, should have a constitutional right for sound basic education. In 2004, the state Supreme Court um, then decided on Hoke County Board of Education versus North North Carolina, which was then Leandro 2.0. Like, that was Leandro 2. So... And so and now I want you to hear this, and I'm sorry, we're going to talk NCAA in closing. I want you to hear this. 1997, the Supreme Court states we have a constitutional right to, to provide children with sound basic education. We have still not done it. To this day, we have, uh, we have been unwilling in the North Carolina General Assembly to appropriate the necessary funding to meet the demand of that court case, which was our constitutional right. So don't tell me you're a constitutionalist. Don't tell me you are a conservative. 
if you're a constitutionalist and if you're a conservative, you do not ignore the Constitution. So don't give me that garbage because that's just not factually accurate. Then there was a Leandro 2.0. That was Hoke County. So initially you had Cumberland, Halifax, Hoke, Robeson, Vance. Hoke County circled back. There was another court case in 2004, and it said that the state, I want you to hear me, the state is responsible for staffing every classroom with a competent teacher, that they were responsible for hiring a competent principal in every school and providing adequate resources to ensure an equitable learning environment. Did you hear me? That we were responsible for now, the, now the Supreme Court has said you get every child a sound basic education, you're responsible for making sure there's a darn good teacher in every classroom and a competent principal in every school. You tell me how many times in the last couple of years have you gotten information from your child who comes home saying they've had long-term subs or they're bouncing subs around. The teachers are taking multiple classrooms. Now, I want you to hear me. When this became the law, when this, this court case was decided, there were no opportunity scholarships. There was no money being appropriated to pull money out of the system at this point. So instead of funding the system, there is an intentional, willful um, effort to underfund the systems and then blame the system and then say, because the system doesn't work, this is why we need to create other systems and give them money. It is like the biggest shell game going. Come on, people, wake up, recognize what we're dealing with. All right, y'all, I'm off that bubble. I'm off that. There was some other stuff I want to talk about. All right, women's basketball real quick with our last three minutes. I'm looking at these brackets. I think everybody's going to be watching TV tonight. I'm, I love the fact that this is going to be probably the most watched women's game ever, and I think this is going to be amazing. And so I'm, I'm excited about games that are coming on tonight. Um, I think this is going to be extraordinary as we kind of consider, you know, I mean, when you got Iowa and LSU, whew, man, it's just going to be. And then you've got UConn and USC. I mean, it's wild. How awesome is that? So, you know, it's coming down. Uh, it's coming down. And then you got South Carolina playing Oregon State. I don't think South Carolina is going to have any problem at all. Um, so you got South Carolina. And um, I don't know. And then you got NC State who coming in on both sides of this. So you got South Carolina and NC State. You got Iowa and LSU. You got USC and UConn. I mean, it, it's just it's just going to be some good stuff. So, um, you know, we've got one, two, three, four games left. That's going to determine who's going to the final game. I I'm torn. I'm really torn. I, I think South Carolina has no problem with Oregon State. Um, I think I'm I'm just emotionally saying yes to NC State. And then I think NC State's going to really struggle with South Carolina. And I think it's going to be a South Carolina. I think it's going to be a South Carolina LSU matchup in the final game. Men, um, what, what, what say y'all? What say y'all? Um, and so we've got NC State and Purdue. Look, I. Who is not loving the NC State Cinderella run? I mean, how awesome is this? I love this reality that anything is possible, man. And so I'm so proud of State. I'm so happy for State. I'm happy for our state. Uh, my money is on NC State. I shouldn't see. I shouldn't say my money because now you know we have legalized sports betting in North Carolina. But that's just vernacular. That's just colloquialism. Um, but I'm, I'm, my money is on NC State UConn in the final game, and I just think. UConn is, I mean, I think NC State's going to do what Villanova did in the 80s against Georgetown. I just think there's just going to be like this shock that they win it all. So I, I my money's on NC State, y'all. I, I think they're going to win it all. What say you? Um, what I know is I'm thrilled for NC State. So I'm shouting out NC State. I'm not a hater. I'm one of those people I can rejoice with you. I can cry with you and I can rejoice with you. All of my NC State folk, I'm rejoicing with the fact that your men's and your women's program have made it this far. Excellent job. Congratulations. I hope it bolsters the enrollment. I hope it in increases our in recruitment, not just at NC State, but all of the schools that have gotten as far as they got as far as they got. Listen, I'm out of 
clock, but I'm not out of content. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of talk. This is James Galliard. You've been listening to the James Galliard Show, and we just simply try to educate you on the matters, the, the, the issues that matter. Today we talked about Project Kitty Hawk. Today we talked about shirt, uh, uh, the short session. Uh, today we talked about uh, some of the issues relative to the party of none, and we talked a little bit about the importance of voting. And so uh, tune in to me, tune, tune in with me next Monday on James Galliard Show. I wish all of you a peaceful and prosperous rest of your day. The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. This is WRSV Elm City. Turn up.